So, so far we've covered multitask learning and meta-learning topics in the context of supervised learning as well as in the context of uh, hierarchical Bayesian models. And so today we're going to talk about what these types of algorithms start to look like when we move into sequential decision-making domains uh, in reinforcement learning. And so today we'll get started on that and we'll start by talking about kind of a, a primer on, on reinforcement learning and the multitask reinforcement learning problem, uh, goal condition variance of that, and uh, then we'll in future lectures over the next couple of weeks cover additional topics in the context of reinforcement learning when you have multiple goals, multiple tasks, et cetera. Um, first, some logistical items. Homework two is due on Wednesday this week. Uh, homework three will be out on Wednesday this week, and homework three will cover uh, topics in goal-conditioned reinforcement learning, and including some of the things that we're talking about today. And the product proposal is due next Wednesday. Okay, so um, first, uh, why should we actually care about reinforcement learning? So uh, we've talked a lot about supervised learning. Supervised learning is, is used in a wide variety of places. Um, and I guess first, to kind of answer this question, let's think about, well, when do you not need sequential decision making? Uh, and anywhere else are things where you need sequential decision making systems. So uh, you don't need sequential decision making systems when your system is making a single isolated decision, uh, such as a classification decision or a regression decision. Uh, and where that decision does not affect future inputs to the system and does not affect future, future decisions. Uh, and so from this point of view, uh, we don't need sequential decision whenever we're kind of in a very isolated black box world. Uh, and actually in the real world, uh, in many cases, our decisions are actually affecting the future or affecting uh, future aspects of the world. So uh, there are many different applications of sequential decision, sequential decision making problems. Uh, in many cases, in some applications, people choose to ignore the dependence of, uh, of future, of the current decision on, on the future, uh, which kind of makes a simplifying assumption. Uh, but in many real world cases, there are, um, there is this effect uh, of, of affecting the future. And so for example, some very common applications of reinforcement learning where you can't afford to ignore this effect include things like robotics, uh, include things like language and dialogue systems when you're interacting with another agent or interacting with a uh, human, for example, uh, in autonomous driving. Uh, the decisions you make affect the, the future observations that you make. Uh, in business operations, uh, in finance, uh, these are all kind of in these sequential, uh, in a sequential decision-making problem setting. Uh, and really most kind of deployed machine learning systems that are deployed in the real world and are interacting with humans are faced with a sequential decision-making problem. Okay, um, so this is uh, in practice why this sort of topic is important. Uh, and also if you're interested in kind of how humans uh, act in the world and how humans are intelligent in the world, uh, these sorts of problems is also kind of a key aspect of our own intelligence. We also can reason about how our actions affect the future. Okay, so reinforcement learning, uh, or in general, sequential decision making is pretty important. Um, and so in this lecture, what we're gonna talk about is first, uh, what is reinforcement learning, or what does multitask learning look like in the reinforcement learning context when you're making uh, sequential decisions? What does this look like uh, in the formulation of policy gradients, which is one uh, one form of reinforcement learning algorithm or one class of reinforcement learning algorithms. What does this look like uh, in, the, in the context of Q-learning? So uh, we'll give a, uh, like a few slides of, of review on Q-learning. This should be a review for most of you because this, this topic is covered in uh, a number of courses like CS221, CS229, um, et cetera. Although policy gradients is not always covered in those courses, so we'll, we'll give, give a little bit more of an in-depth overview of those. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about approaches for multitask Q learning, goal condition Q learning, um, and algorithms that, that significantly improve upon kind of the naive approach to multitask learning uh, in combination with reinforcement learning. Okay, uh, so first let's talk about uh, the problem statement. Uh, and we can do this by looking at an example. So, so far we've been looking at things like object classification, regression, these isolated uh, problems where we need to, need to make um, predictions. And uh, in contrast, we could think about something like object manipulation, where we have very much a sequential decision-making problem. So you can view uh, the, the problem of object classification as a supervised learning problem, and the problem of object manipulation as a sequential decision-making problem. 
Uh, and what are the differences between these two problems? So in supervised learning so far, we've assumed that we have IID data, data that is independently and identically distributed according to some distribution. Uh, whereas in sequential decision making, your action that you take affects the next state that you're in. So the data that you're seeing is very much not IID. Uh, second, so in supervised learning, we have some typically assume some large data set that's maybe actually curated by humans to ensure that it has a distribution that you care about. Uh, whereas in things like sequential decision making, you need to collect the data yourself in many cases. Um, and it's also not clear what the labels are. Uh, you aren't really, you kind of need to figure out what this might be in a different, in different applications. Uh, and then lastly, in things like supervised learning, you generally have a fairly well-defined notion of success, which is, corresponds to some error or some prediction accuracy correspond, uh, in relation to the, the labels. Whereas in uh, things like reinforcement learning, success is a little bit more uh, gray. Okay, so these are some of the kind of biggest differences between uh, these two problem domains. Uh, and so before we go into like what concretely the problem looks like, let's look over some terminology and notation. So uh, similar to before, we'll say that we have some neural network that's gonna be making some predictions and in the classification setting, uh, you might be looking at an image and then classifying the class corresponding to that image, uh, corresponding to different, uh, different types of animals, for example. Now, uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, we're no longer going to be making um, predictions like that. We'll be instead uh, using uh, our policy. Uh, this policy will be taking actions, and the actions will affect the next state. Um, so there will be this feedback loop that goes from the action to uh, back to the observation. Uh, and our our classes won't look something won't look like this. They might look more like this. So we might uh, need to figure out if we should run away, if we should ignore, if we should pet the the tiger. Etc. Okay, so we need to make decisions. Um, o is denoting the observation that the agent or the, the system receives as input. A is denoting the action. Uh, pi is denoting the policy, which is parameterized by theta. And typically we assume that there's some underlying state of the world S. Uh, and so in the fully observed setting, we get to observe S. Uh, and in the partially observed setting, we get to observe O. Um, what concretely is the difference between S and O? Uh, one example of this is you may have, um, you may be uh, trying to chase a, um, a hyena or something, and uh, if you're given an image or something, that would be an observation. Uh, whereas in contrast, if you're given the pose of the uh, respective animals, then that would be the state. You'd basically be able to fully observe uh, the system, uh, the underlying state of the system, and the things that, that matter for making uh, decisions in the world. Uh, and in particular, in partially observed settings, uh, you might not just receive an image, you may also have occlusions in the image where you can actually see uh, part of the state. Okay, so this is kind of the, the basic uh, kind of terminology corresponding to reinforcement learning. Uh, now, one very basic approach to this sort of sequential decision-making problem is to treat it as a supervised learning problem. So what you could do is you could say, okay, uh, I just want to uh, perform, I just want to imitate some expert, for example. So uh, maybe you could collect a bunch of driving data, uh, collect the observation that the person sees and collect the action that they took in those states, uh, put this into some big training data set, uh, and then sample IID from the training data set doing supervised learning to, um, to train your policy to predict actions from observations. Okay, so we've already actually seen a little bit of imitation learning. So there was a paper presentation um, a week or two ago that was looking at um, how we can apply meta-learning to things like imitation learning. Uh, these approaches generally work uh, pretty well in some contexts. For example, if you have a lot of data, uh, expert data of performing the right actions, uh, then these, these systems can actually do something fairly reasonable. Um, the place where these kinds of systems tend to fail are when you have very long, uh, very long horizon problems, you'll have compounding errors. Uh, as uh, basically as you make actions, you'll start to move off of the manifold of the data and then your errors will, will compound um, until you're well off of the manifold of the training data. Um, and also these systems don't reason about outcomes in any way. Uh, they're just trying to mimic what the data is doing rather than trying to accomplish some particular outcome. Okay, so this is where reinforcement learning comes in. Um, and for reinforcement learning, we need some notion of what's called a reward function. 
Uh, and this reward function should capture what states and actions are better or worse uh, for the system. So this typically takes in both a state and an action, uh, and it tells us which states and actions are better. For example, if we're driving, we might have a very high reward if we're, we look like this, and have a low reward if we see something like this. Okay. So the, um, in aggregate, the states, the actions, and the rewards, as well as the dynamics of the system, define a Markov decision process. And this is en encapsulating the notion of a sequential decision-making problem. Okay, any, uh, any questions up until here? This should, should mostly be a review for people. Okay, cool. So the goal of reinforcement learning uh, is typically to learn some policy that takes uh, as input, uh, in this case, we'll look at the fully observed setting, takes as input some state, and makes predictions about actions. Uh, the goal is to learn uh, the, the policy, uh, the parameters of that policy. So uh, if we're in a deep reinforcement learning setting, your policy will probably be parameterized as a neural network, um, where the states are being passed as input, you're producing, uh, producing actions, the actions are fed into the world, uh, and then the world gives you the next state that's fed back into your policy. Okay. Um, and so we can actually characterize the system as the graphical model here, uh, where we have a policy that's taking in, in the, in this case, in, in the partially observed setting, a policy that's taking in the observation and producing an action. Uh, the dynamics are uh, taking in the current state and the current action and producing a distribution over the next state. Um, and one thing that's pretty important is that this dynamics function is independent of the previous state. Uh, this is what's known as the Markov property, which is that basically uh, kind of the definition of a state in a Markov decision process is that uh, you can fully define uh, the reward function and the dynamics uh, from that, the information in that state variable independent of previous states. Uh, and the way, the way that you can see that is if you look at this dynamics distribution here, this only depends on st and at and doesn't depend on st minus 1. Okay, uh, and then the goal of reinforcement learning and typically kind of the way that we can formulate a concrete objective here is that we want to be able to maximize the expected reward uh, under our policy. And in the infinite horizon case, we can imagine the stationary distribution over states and actions arising from our policy uh, and maximize the reward function uh, under that stationary distribution. Uh, and in the finite horizon case, we might have some horizon capital T and we want to maximize the rewards of the states and actions visited by our policy, when rolling out our policy. Yeah? So are the actions here taken before the observation or after the observation? So like is A1 taken just before we observe observation one, or is it taken just after? It's taken just after. So you observe observation one, and then, uh, and that's shown, that's shown right here, and then your policy produ predicts an action from that observation, and that action is then fed, uh, then the kind of the world, that action is actually executed in the real world, and that produces the next state, which produces uh, the next observation. It seems like you would, uh, the states produce the, it seems like you would want to use the state to make your action, but it sounds like you're saying the model doesn't try and convert it into a state for it. You're saying. So the, I guess there's a couple different versions of how you might handle the partial observability. Maybe one point of confusion here is the arrowheads on these arrows are very hard to see, and the, there's an arrow going from state to observation, and not an arrow going from observation to state. Um, your, what your policy could do is it could try to form some like estimate of the current state from your observation, and then like do some sort of inference, and then pass that to your policy to predict the next observation. State here is the real state of the world rather than an embedded state from the policy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the state is the the real state. Okay. Cool. So now that we've talked about kind of the reinforcement learning problem, um, what is a reinforcement learning task? Uh, and we're going to define this for the sake of uh, thinking about the multitask learning setting. So remember in supervised learning, we defined a task uh, as this, as corresponding to the data distribution or the, the, the data generating distributions, P of X and P of Y given X, as well as some loss function. Uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, our task will be defined as basically just a Markov decision process. So uh, the task will be defined by some state space, 
S, some action space A, uh, some initial state distribution, P of S1, uh, your dynamics function, uh, S prime given S and A, and the reward function. So if you look at uh, the uh, kind of, if you compare this to the supervised learning setting, uh, the initial state distribution, the dynamics are basically the same as the data generating distributions. The reward function uh, corresponds to the loss function um, and the state and action space are just kind of telling you uh, what is the general set that your states and actions lie within. Okay, so this is just a Markov decision process. Um, and I guess one thing worth mentioning here is that if these, if the different MDPs are different tasks, then this is much more than just the semantic meaning of a task. Because uh, different tasks could have the same exact reward function but have different action spaces, for example, or have different dynamics. Um, and so we'll use the term task loosely to describe these different Markov decision processes. Okay, so what are some examples of what different task distributions might look like or settings where we might actually want to apply multitask learning in the reinforcement learning setting? Uh, so one example uh, that we saw earlier actually is a supervised learning problem but really is a sequential decision making problem is a recommendation system where you want to be able to recommend videos or recommend treatments or recommend other things to a particular person. And you could imagine different people as being different tasks in the system. Different people have different preferences, have different, um, operate in different ways. Uh, and so if you kind of view this personalized recommendation uh, problem as a multitask learning problem, then you can view it as a setting where uh, the dynamics and the reward function vary across tasks. Um, the dynamics correspond to how that person will react to a particular action that you take and the reward function corresponds to whether, to whether or not what you do, uh, uh, whether, whether or not you recommend something to them reduce, re results in a state that is good. In some contexts, the initial state distribution may also vary for different people. It depends on the uh, particular, like how you formulate your problem. Okay, so this is one example. Um, another example where reinforcement learning has been applied uh, has been in character animation. Uh, and you can imagine uh, trying to animate different uh, characters in computer graphics across different maneuvers, for example. Uh, so there's been some work applying reinforcement learning to learning uh, for learning maneuvers like this. Uh, and in this case, if you treat this as a multitask learning problem, different tasks would have different reward functions um, in this setting, but the dynamics would be the same, the initial state distribution would be the same, as well as the state and action space. Okay, uh, and then another setting where uh, reinforcement learning has been applied is for uh, dressing, uh, putting on clothes. And this is actually a really challenging problem in computer graphics because of de the deformable objects. Uh, it also has applications in assistive robotics, for example. Uh, and in this setting, uh, things like the initial state distribution, what, what is the garment, what state is the garment in before you put it on, as well as the dynamics are going to vary across tasks but the underlying reward function might be the same, uh, such as putting the clothes on the person. Uh, and then one last example of, of a task distribution might be if we wanna be able to do reinforcement learning across different robotic platforms. Um, we may still wanna do the same task across these platforms, like, like having them learn how to grasp things, uh, but in this case, the state space and the action space would, be, would vary across tasks. The initial state distribution and the dynamics would also vary across tasks as the robots have different uh, degrees of freedom and react to actions in different ways, but the underlying reward function could be the same. Of course, if you want the robots to do different things, then the reward function would be different. Any questions on these examples? Or any questions about other examples? Okay, cool. So this is a reinforcement learning task. Um, now, one alternative way to view multitask reinforcement learning uh, is as follows. So we'll typically have some sort of task identifier that's part of the state, and this is required to make it a fully observable setting or a fully observable uh, MDP. And the notation I'm using here is that S bar is gonna denote the original state space or the original state, and ZI is gonna denote the task identifier as in previous lectures. Now, if you take this view, then interestingly, what you can take is you can look at, uh, you can basically fold uh, looking at the task identifier and determining, um, determining the dynamics and determining the reward into a single dynamics function and a single reward function. Uh, and then basically view 
uh, your set of tasks as just a single, single task standard Markov decision process where the state space and the action space are just the union of the state spaces and action spaces in the original tasks. Uh, the, the initial state distribution just corresponds to a mixture distribution over your initial state distributions for each of those tasks. The dynamics and the reward function are folded into the, um, are, are just, there's just a single dynamics and a single reward function that takes as input the task identifier and produces either the next state or the reward. So basically you can essentially view, you can basically apply standard reinforcement learning algorithms, standard single task reinforcement learning algorithms to the multitask problem with this view on multitask RL. Questions on this? So basically multitask RL is the same as before, as the same as the single task reinforcement learning problem, except we'll have a task identifier that's part of the state. Uh, this task identifier could be something like a one-hot task ID, like we had described in the supervised learning context. It could be a language description of the task. Uh, it could be a desired goal state that you want to reach. Uh, and this would be what's known as goal-conditioned reinforcement learning, where you condition it on a particular state that you want to be able to reach in the future. Um, and what is the reward function? Well, it could be just the same as before, where it takes as input the task ID and, and outputs the reward function corresponding to that task for that state. Um, or for things like goal-conditioned reinforcement learning, it can correspond to simply the negative distance between your current state or your current original state and the goal state. Um, and some examples of distance functions might be Euclidean uh, distance. It could be Euclidean distance in some latent space. Uh, it could also be a sparse zero one reward function that corresponds, that is one when S bar equals SG and zero when they're not equal. Okay, so you might ask, okay, if, if this is just a standard Markov decision process, why not just apply standard reinforcement learning algorithms? Uh, and as I mentioned, you can, uh, and this will work. Uh, well, it will be more challenging than, than, the, than the individual single tasks because you will have a wider distribution of things in general. Uh, but in general, you can apply these, these same types of algorithms, but you can often do better. Uh, and we'll discuss that a bit in this lecture. Okay. Great, any questions on how it can be formulated as a single task RL problem? Yeah, so I view goal-conditioned RL as a special case of multitask reinforcement learning, where um, the task descriptor corresponds to the goal state, and the tasks correspond to goal-reaching tasks. Okay, so let's get into some algorithms. So uh, the first class of, I guess, I guess I'll start off by saying that kind of let's, we can look at broadly at kind of the, the anatomy and, and like the class of reinforcement learning algorithms and how these approaches relate to each other. And then I'll talk a bit about um, two classes of algorithms. So um, we can generally view reinforcement learning algorithms in the following flow graph where we first are generating samples uh, in our environment. This is just running the policy forward typically. Then we fit some model to estimate the return. Uh, and then we use that model to improve the policy. And then different algorithms typically correspond to just differences in this green box and in this blue box. Uh, so for example, uh, one, uh, one example of fitting a model might be just fitting something to the return, estimating the empirical return, such as using the Monte Carlo policy gradient. Um, another example of estimating the return might be to try to fit a Q function uh, using, for example, dynamic programming algorithms. Uh, and another example of fitting a model would be to uh, estimate a function that models the dynamics. Uh, and once we have any of these models, we could then, uh, for example, apply the policy gradient to our policy parameters. We can improve the policy by taking the max over Q values for our current Q function. Um, or in the case of model-based algorithms, we can optimize a policy by, for example, backpropagating through our model into our policy. 
Um, so this is kind of a, a general outlook on reinforcement learning algorithms where we have different choices for fitting a model to estimate the return, different choices for improving the policy. We also have different choices for how we generate samples, although those are uh, generally, that decision is generally orthogonal to the choice of algorithm. And in this lecture, we'll focus on model-free reinforcement learning methods, uh, such as policy gradient methods and Q-learning methods. Uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll stick with these algorithms for the next uh, two weeks about. Uh, and then on uh, the lecture on November 6th, we'll focus on model-based RL methods uh, and how they can be applied to the multitask setting. Okay, uh, so let's start with policy gradients. So uh, this is our objective uh, in reinforcement learning. So we want to be able to sample trajectories from our policy uh, and estimate the return. So we'll refer to this objective as J of theta. And uh, this is just rewriting J of theta. You can view this or you can estimate this as uh, rolling out and trajectories uh, for example, shown here, uh, and estimating the uh, computing the reward for each of those trajectories. Um, so maybe the first trajectory has a high reward, the middle trajectory has a uh, medium reward, and the, the last trajectory has a bad reward. Uh, and so this first sum is the sum over the samples from our policy, and the second sum is a sum over time. So this is a way that we can um, kind of estimate the, the expectation shown on the left. Now, what we could think about doing is, can we differentiate through this objective directly into our policy? Um, so if our objective is the expected reward, and we can estimate this, or, or where the reward of a trajectory, I'm just using shorthand to denote that as a sum over time of the reward function of the individual states. Um, you can view this as uh, this expectation as an integral over pi theta, uh, because the expectation is with respect to pi theta of r of tau. Okay, so this is our objective. Uh, and if we want to be able to compute the gradient of this objective with respect to our policy parameters, uh, we get something like this. So we can move the gradient uh, inside uh, the integral because it's a linear operation. And uh, then we basically have the, the integral of the gradient of the policy <coughs> times the reward function integrated over trajectories. Okay, so this is uh, the gradient. Uh, now, how do we actually go about evaluating this gradient? So we, do, we don't want to have to uh, integrate over all possible trajectories. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this very convenient identity, uh, which is known as the likelihood ratio trick. And in particular, what this identity shows is that, whoops, uh, which is that if we uh, are looking at the, the policy parameter, the, sorry, the, the policy probability for a trajectory times the gradient of the log of the policy, this is equal to uh, the, uh, if we basically just differentiate through the log, uh, we, this is equal to the policy times the gradient of pi divided by pi. Uh, and of course, the two pi's uh, on the top and on the bottom can cancel, and this is just equal to the gradient of pi, or the gradient of, um, of the policy with respect to the, pol the policy parameters. Okay, so we have this very convenient uh, identity, and we can use it to uh, expand out this equation. So uh, we can basically replace these, uh, this term with the term on the left uh, to get an integral that looks like this. And very conveniently, this integral now looks a lot like an expectation. So uh, this is an expectation under pi theta. Uh, and so we can simply uh, evaluate the gradient or estimate the gradient by uh, taking an expectation over, over trajectories sampled from our policy uh, and using those samples to evaluate the gradient of the log probability of our policy weighted by the reward of that trajectory. Okay, so I guess to kind of recap what we did there, this first trajectory we don't want to have to integrate over all possible trajectories, and so instead we're able to transform that into an expectation over trajectories drawn from the distribution of our policy. Okay, so in, then once we have this gradient, we can, um, we can use it, by actually differentiate and uh, compute this gradient and actually apply that gradient to our policy parameters. Okay, so this is all with respect to trajectories. Um, one thing that is, uh, one thing that's important to do is actually break this down into states and actions. 
So we're denoting the uh, pi of tau as uh, pi of the full trajectory, which can be broken down into uh, the initial state uh, density times a product over time of the uh, policy probability and the dynamics probability. So this is the, basically the probability of the trajectory under our policy. Uh, if we take the log of both sides of the equation, we get log uh, pi of theta of tau, uh, and then just change the, the products into sums using the log. And we can basically uh, plug in the right hand side of the equation into the equation on the left, into our form for the gradient. Now, unfortunately, if we just applied this uh, naively, we would have a term that corresponds to the probability of our state or our next state given our state in action. Uh, and we don't know that probability value. Um, but we can, um, one thing that you note know is that because this, uh, this is a, a gradient with respect to theta, these terms don't depend on theta. They're constant with respect to theta. And so uh, the gradient of theta with respect to those terms is zero. Uh, and then we get, uh, so we then get the, the kind of the final gradient, which corresponds to this term right here. So uh, this is basically uh, log probability of pi of a given s. This is something that we can evaluate because our policy will output a distribution over a uh, conditioned on s. And this right term is just the reward function given the state and the action. Okay, so this is kind of the vanilla policy gradient. Uh, and this is something that we can very clearly evaluate. Um, and so, what this looks like uh, as an algorithm uh, is basically we can estimate, uh, basically we can run, roll out our policy to get trajectories. We can then estimate the policy gradient by averaging over those trajectories uh, over time of the, uh, the, the gradient grad log pi times the reward function uh, and then apply the gradient uh, to our policy parameters. So if we go back to our diagram, uh, Collecting data corresponds to the orange box. Uh, evaluating the return corresponds to the green box. And actually using that to improve the policy uh, in the last step corresponds to the blue box. And then what this looks like as an algorithm, which is called uh, the reinforced algorithm, uh, is explicitly sampling trajectories from your policy and then computing the gradient uh, using those trajectories and then using that estimated gradient to update your policy parameters. And then you can repeat this step to iteratively improve your policy. Okay, so this is the algorithm. Um, how does this compare to something like imitation learning, like maximum likelihood of expert actions? So uh, if you look at the policy gradient, um, and you instead also look at kind of the, the imitation learning approach where you do uh, supervised learning with respect to actions, uh, the maximum likelihood objective looks pretty similar to the, the gradient of the policy, um, the, the policy gradient form. And in particular, the difference is that uh, the, is just the reward term on the right. So basically policy gradient will correspond to taking, um, maximizing the probability of actions that have high reward. And if they have low reward, then uh, you, you'll have a, you'll try to maximize it less essentially. Okay, now one of the really nice things about this is that uh, because we, it's just basically a gradient descent algorithm, it's very easy to apply multitask learning algorithms to it. Uh, we can basically, be, it corresponds uh, very similarly to maximum likelihood, likelihood problems. So all of the things that we learned about in maximum likelihood supervised learning can be applied to the reinforcement learning context. Okay, so this is nice. Um, Let's go into one more slide kind of on, on intuitively what this algorithm is doing. Um, so if we look at the uh, kind of the form of the, the gradient, uh, which corresponds to the kind of grad log pi of a given s, uh, and look at maximum likelihood, um, we can say that, okay, we have trajectories. If we do maximum likelihood imitation learning, we're just trying to imitate uh, the best trajectories. Uh, whereas in policy gradient, what we're trying to do is we have some, some distribution over these trajectories, and then we're going to try to uh, 
increase the probability of the actions that had high reward uh, and place less probability mass on the actions that had low reward. Uh, and so as a result, we'll basically just be making the good stuff more likely, making the stuff that gets bad reward less likely, um, and kind of formalizing this notion of trial and error. You, you try a few things, you do more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. Okay, so that's policy gradients. Um, and it's pretty easy to combine with things like multitask learning. Uh, it's also pretty, to com pretty easy to combine with things like meta-learning. Uh, so the meta-learning algorithms that we learned, such as MAML and black box meta-learning algorithms, uh, just assume that you can get some gradient uh, of your objective. And so we can readily apply these to, uh, readily apply uh, these algorithms to in combination with policy gradient algorithms. Uh, so for example, uh, here's a very toy example of MAML with policy gradients where there's just two tasks. One of the tasks is running forward and one of the tasks is running backwards. Uh, so we're not evaluating generalization in, in any way. We're just gonna look at whether or not it can learn to adapt its policy with a single gradient step for one of these two tasks. Uh, and what we see is first at the end of meta-learning, basically at this point right here at the end of meta-learning, but before taking a gradient step to a one of the tasks, we get a policy that looks like this. Uh, it's running in place, essentially like ready to, to run in either of the two directions. And if we then uh, take one gradient step with respect to the task of running backward, with the reward function of running backward, uh, we get a policy that looks like this. And if we take a single policy gradient step with respect to the reward function of running forward, we get a policy that looks like this. Um, and so I guess one of the interesting things that this shows is that uh, there does exist a representation under which reinforcement learning is very fast and very efficient, um, at least in the context of a few tasks. Uh, and I guess another thing worth mentioning here is that the policy gradient was evaluated with respect to 20 trajectories uh, from pi theta. Uh, so basically 20 trajectories similar to the video showed on the previous slide. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, what about black box methods? Uh, so we can also apply policy gradient to black box methods. What this corresponds to is using um, some LSTM policy, some policy with memory or recurrence, uh, and training that policy with the policy gradient algorithm, or, or a variant of the policy gradient algorithm that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so for example, in uh, this, this previous paper that was actually uh, presented uh, a few weeks ago in class, uh, one of the experiments that they looked at was learning to visually navigate a maze. Uh, and so what they did is they trained the algorithm on a thousand different small mazes and then evaluated the algorithm's ability to learn how to solve new mazes, uh, including both small mazes and large mazes. Uh, and so we can look uh, at what it does. So here, this is first showing uh, after meta-learning, uh, the beginning of rolling out the recurrent policy. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't know the task and it needs to navigate the maze. Uh, and the left is showing the, uh, the agent's point of view and the right is showing the maze. And then after it gets this experience, it then is able to learn how to solve the maze with basically just a single trajectory. Um, so it first navigated around that maze to explore. And then at the end of that episode, the memory of the, uh, of the architecture is not reset. And it, you keep on rolling forward that, that memory, that black box, architecture, and it can figure out how to, uh, from there, based on what's stored in memory, how to solve the task. Uh, and they also looked at bigger mazes, so here's an example of it navigating through a bigger maze. At the beginning, it's just exploring, it needs to figure out how to solve the task. Uh, so it explores um, different parts of the maze. This is one of the, the um, I guess both of these examples are successful examples, there's also failure cases. Um, so here's one, in this case, after it sees a single trajectory, it's able to very quickly navigate to the goal position. Okay, yeah. I'm confused as to how much data is required for this? Uh, so how many inner loops do you need for meta loops? Yeah, so for MAML, the number of, um, the, the inner loop corresponded to 20 trajectories and one, grade, one policy gradient step. In this example, the inner loop corresponds to basically like two trajectories. 
um, where you could basically see the trajectories on the um, on the thing. So uh, here's the this is the first trajectory shown here, and then the second trajectory is when it actually um, solves the task well. Does that answer your question? This is after meta learning, yes. Yeah, so this is the inner loop. Yeah, and then the outer loop is trained uh, a lot uh, for um, across the different tasks. So this is trained across a thousand mazes during the meta training process. Uh, and then, yeah. And it practices a lot for those uh, mazes, yeah. Is the agent just working with raw sensory input or is it aware of the layout of the maze? Yeah, so in this case, it's just, it just gets this as input. It doesn't get the, the layout of the maze. Uh, and in the case of the ant example, it just receives like join angles uh, and other state information. Yeah. Uh, so why did the second trajectory start with the end of the first trajectory? So in both of these examples, after the end of the first trajectory, it just it's it is reset to the initial position. Does that answer your question? Um, so I think that it, after it reaches the end here, it is then reset to this position again. We can watch it again one more time if you want to verify. So it goes to the goal and then it's respawned right there again. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I guess as of like last year, I think that these sorts of maze tasks are probably the most complicated tasks that I've seen these algorithms do. This year I've seen more complex tasks that these algorithms have been able to learn quickly, um, ranging from being able to adapt to uh, learn how to run on an entirely new agent or, or like a simulated robot to um, solving, uh, like, actually settings where the, the tasks themselves were partially observable, not just the, um, I guess this is, this is also partially observable, but partially observable to a greater degree, I guess. Um, and then I've also seen tasks where um, it's like there are different manipulation tasks and it can generalize to an entirely new manipulation task, like robotic manipulation task. But those are those are all like very very recent works. But yeah, th th better more 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 better things to come. Yeah. In general, do you see the same behavior uh, between like black box and Mabel in the RL case, where Mabel basically uses kind of nitrogen to identify Yeah. So this is a good question. Um, we'll so we'll cover meta reinforcement learning in more detail um, next week on Wednesday when there's going to be a guest lecture by Kate. Uh, but. One thing that I'll say here is, I guess first, one of the things in the reinforcement learning setting, we talked about how MAML is very expressive uh, in the supervised learning setting. Uh, in the reinforcement learning setting, it's actually not very expressive because, um, because of the policy gradient. Basically, if the reward function is zero for all of your trajectories, then your gradient will always be zero. And so even if it gets lots of rich experience about the environment, with zero reward, it can't actually incorporate that experience to update the policy. And that's just, that's just one example. There's other examples where the policy gradient isn't very informative. And so as a result, MAML with policy gradients isn't actually very expressive and has, um, well, is, is, yeah, is not as good. Um, the, in general, applying these algorithms to the reinforcement learning setting is pretty easy to combine with policy gradients. Combining them with methods like Q-learning and actor-critic algorithms is a lot more challenging, and Kate will talk about that uh, certainly a lot during her lecture, um, and some of the challenges that, that come up there. Um, the biggest thing is that those algorithms aren't uh, a gradient-based algorithm. They're a dynamic programming algorithm, so it, it's harder to combine these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you built up made learning algorithms compatible with things like curiosity that can expand on existing RL algorithms? Yeah, so curiosity-based approaches and other exploration methods in general can certainly be combined. Like That's just in a kind of an objective, and you could use that objective as one of your tasks. You could augment all of your tasks with that objective, or you could imagine trying to learn exploration strategies, like learn curiosity, like learn different forms of curiosity that are particularly effective for a class of tasks or a class of environments. 
Um, and Kate will talk about kind of learning exploration strategies in a lecture next week. Yeah. Advantage estimation. You mean um, GAE, generalized advantage estimation? <coughs> yeah, so um, the, I guess there's, there's, different, there's different ways. So I guess to, to explain to other people kind of what the question is, so one of the challenges with policy gradients is that uh, the gradient estimate that it gives you is high variance. And one thing that people typically do uh, to mitigate, to, to reduce the variance of this is to use what's called a baseline. Um, which corresponds to some, uh, which basically corresponds to, which is something that's subtracted from the reward term here. Uh, and it is, gives you an unbiased estimate of this gradient, but that has lower variance. Uh, and there are different techniques for estimating uh, that baseline, and one of them corresponds to things like uh, generalized advantage estimation um, and other things. Uh, in the original uh, implementation of the MAML algorithm, we used a Monte Carlo estimator for the baseline um, rather than a bootstrapped estimator. I think applying a bootstrapped estimator would be, like applying MAML to that would be a bit tricky. You could, of course, always do it from scratch on, on your batch of data, uh, but applying MAML to it is a little bit tricky be just because of uh, how, because uh, bootstrapping isn't a gradient-based algorithm, it's a uh, dynamic programming algorithm. Yeah, that, that was my question, so it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Okay. So some of the pros of policy gradients uh, to recap is that it's very simple. Uh, it gives you, and it kind of just gives you a gradient of your policy, which is very nice. Uh, it's also very easy to combine with existing multitask algorithms and meta-learning algorithms, as we saw in the last couple slides. Uh, the downsides is that first it produces a high variance gradient, uh, and this can be mitigated with baselines. Uh, and baselines are basically used by all algorithms in practice. I don't have time to cover them um, in this lecture, but uh, feel free to come to office hours if you're interested in learning more. It can also be mitigated with trust regions, uh, with which people have also used. Uh, and both, of, both MAML and the black box methods were using both baselines and trust regions in the optimization to uh, make things more stable and uh, more effective. Uh, the other downside of policy gradient algorithms is that it requires on policy data. Uh, and in particular, the way that you can see this is you can see that this expectation is with respect to pi theta. And pi theta is your current policy. So in order to improve your policy, you need data from your current policy. Uh, and this is really important because this means that you can't reuse any data from your previous policies to estimate, to try to improve your policy. Um, it also means you can't reuse data from other tasks or from, for, from, from other things, basically. Uh, and this is, this is really challenging, and as a result, these algorithms tend to be less sample efficient than um, algorithms that are able to reuse data uh, from previous policies, um, from, from other experience, et cetera. Things like importance weighting can help with this. Uh, so you can basically add a, add a weight that, uh, that is, corresponds to the ratio between the policy, between your current policy and the policy that you collected data with. Uh, but these importance weights also tend to give you high variance, especially when those two policies are very different. Okay. Cool. So now that we've talked about policy gradients, um, let's talk about value-based reinforcement learning. Uh, and in particular, the, uh, the benefit of value-based RL is that uh, first, they, um, they tend to be lower variance uh, by introducing some amount of bias. And they um, can use off policy data, which is the, the bigger, which is like a really uh, important thing if you care about reusing data and being sample efficient. Okay, um, so for a very brief overview of these algorithms, for those of you who uh, are a little bit rusty, so uh, a value function, uh, first let's go over some definitions. So a value function corresponds to the total reward that you will achieve starting from state s and following some policy pi. Uh, so this is a function of both the policy and your current state. And a Q function, oh, it's in, and this kind of captures how good is a state, basically, how valuable is that state. And a Q function corresponds to the same thing as a value function, but uh, the total reward starting from state S, taking action A, and from there following pi. Uh, so the A that's passed out as input is a parameter and is, does not depend on the policy pi. 
Uh, and this is basically telling you how good is a state action pair. Uh, both of these things are very closely related. So as I alluded to, the value function corresponds to uh, an expectation over action. The value function of our current policy corresponds to the expectation under a policy of Q of the state as input and the, the action sampled from your policy. Uh, and one of the things that's really nice about your Q function is that if you know the Q function for your current policy, you can use it to improve your policy. Uh, so for example, uh, one very naive way to see this is that if you just set uh, the probability of taking an action for your current state to one for every action that is the max of uh, the arg max of the Q value, uh, this is just going to increase the probability of taking actions that have maximal Q values. Then the new policy resulting from this will be at least as good as the old policy uh, and typically better. Okay. Um, so the goal of value-based RL is to, to learn these, um, to learn at least the Q function, uh, and then use that Q function to perform the task or to perform um, or to, to learn a policy. Uh, and one kind of critical identity that's important for these types of algorithms is noting that for the optimal policy, uh, we have this equality that is satisfied. So we know that the Q function for the optimal policy is equal to uh, the expectation of states visited under the dynamics of the reward function plus uh, gamma times the max of actions of the index Q function, uh, where gamma here is representing uh, some discount factor. Uh, and the way that you can see this uh, is that uh, basically if you take a reward and then uh, if at a current time step you observe some reward and then um, you know kind of the, the kind of the reward in the future, for the best action, um, that's going to equal the best, uh, the best uh, value from your current state and current action. Uh, and this is what's known as the Bellman equation. Okay, so we can use this Bellman equation to uh, learn a Q function. So um, what this looks like is uh, this is one example of a, a of an algorithm that's called fitted Q iteration. And um, what this looks like is you first uh, collect a data set using some policy. Uh, and the hyperparameters corresponding to this are the data set size and the, the policy that you use for data collection. Uh, you can then set uh, the reward plus the max Q as uh, some target label. And then improve your policy uh, to try to match those target values. Um, so you're essentially trying to uh, run a dynamic programming algorithm that leads to the Bellman equation holding for your Q function. Um, and so for example, if your Q function is represented, uh, has parameters phi, uh, that might be some neural network that takes as input the state in action and outputs the Q value, a scalar value for that state in action. Um, another way to parameterize this in discrete action cases is if you just pass in the state uh, and then output the Q value for each of the actions, correspond for, for that state. Um, that's, that's often used in practice. Uh, and then the other hyperparameter values that, uh, that, that you have in this algorithm correspond to uh, the number of gradient steps you take uh, and the number of iterations that you perform this for. So in practice, you're going to be iterating between collecting a data set, computing your, your target values, trying to fit your Q function to those target values, and then iteratively uh, fitting your Q function and also recollecting your data set. Okay, and then the result of this procedure is that you get, uh, you can get a policy by simply taking the argmax of your Q function for a given state. So take the actions in a current state that maximize your future reward or your future returns. Okay, so this is uh, a, uh, a Q learning style, style algorithm. Um, some important notes here. Uh, first, we can reuse data from previous policies. So this doesn't make any assumptions about the underlying uh, algorithm, there's no expectations with respect to pi theta um, in, in any of this. Uh, and so as a result, it's what's called an off-policy algorithm because it can use off-policy data. Uh, and as a result, you could use uh, replay buffers. So you can store data, uh, you can aggregate data across all of your experience into a single replay buffer. And uh, when computing this update, you can load from your replay buffer uh, any kind of any source of data. And this allows you to 
uh, one, kind of keep on aggregating data and reusing that data, and two, uh, get more data that is uh, decorrelated. So if you just uh, kind of get some data online and then make updates, you'll have uh, very correlated data, which will result in uh, poor performance. Okay, another thing to note, uh, as I mentioned before, is that this is not a gradient descent algorithm. This is a dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, and you can see that by uh, the fact that this, um, this update affects the targets at the next value right here. Uh, and as a result, it's tricky to kind of combine this approach with things like MAML um, and, and even black box methods in practice. Um, but it is relatively easy to combine with algorithms like multitask learning, learning algorithms and goal condition learning algorithms by simply conditioning your Q function or your policy on the task identifier or the goal. Okay. Um, so let's talk about multitask Q learning. Any questions on kind of the setup for Q learning before I move on? Okay, so um, for multitask RL, we can just kind of take our policy and condition it on some task identifier, likewise for our Q function. Um, and in each of these cases, I'm using, again, using S bar to denote the kind of original state space, uh, where the, the kind of the, the, the new augmented state corresponds to the original state space and the task identifier. Um, and analogous to multitask learning, we can use a lot of the things that we've learned about before, like stratified sampling, like hard and soft uh, weight sharing, uh, other architectural changes, et cetera. Um, so this is quite nice. Uh, we can reuse the things that we've learned across supervised learning and reinforced learning. Uh, now what's different? So there are some things that are different that, about reinforcement learning that we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture that affect the algorithm choices that we make. So the first thing that's different is that the data distribution is controlled by the agent. It's no longer just given to us. Uh, and so one of the things we can think about is can we reuse, can we think about how, how should we explore data in a way that's effective for multiple tasks? And also can we think about not just weight sharing but also data sharing across tasks? And how should we, when we collect a batch of data, how should we choose to share that data across the tasks? Uh, and second, you may also know what aspects of the MDP are changing within your task distribution. And if you know this, you can actually leverage this knowledge in certain ways uh, in your algorithm choice by making assumptions about whether or not one aspect of the MDP is going to be changing across tasks. Okay, um, so let's think about an example for thinking about how we can, how we might want to go about sharing data or leveraging this sort of information. Um, so say we are playing hockey. Uh, and uh, we have some, uh, some of our, our teammates and some of our opponents, uh, and we may want to be trying to practice different tasks. Uh, so we may want to be able to practice passing uh, the puck from, uh, from yourself to your teammate, and you may also want to be able to practice shooting goals. Now, uh, if you're considering this multitask learning problem, um, what if during practice you accidentally perform uh, a very good pass to your, uh, to your teammate when you're trying to shoot a goal. Well, if this happens, uh, it makes sense, of course, to store your experience as normal, but you could also take that experience and say, well, okay, even though I was trying to shoot a goal, I don't need to just use that for shooting a goal. I can also say, okay, in hindsight, if I was doing task two, uh, that would have been great. I would have gotten a, a kind of a very high reward for that task, right? And so you can relabel that experience with the task two identifier and with the reward function for that task and store that data for that task. Okay, so this is something that's known as hindsight relabeling, which is that in hindsight, you can kind of take some experience that you collected with the intention of one task, relabel it for another task, uh, and use that in learning the other task. Okay, uh, it's also referred to sometimes as hindsight experience replay as well, or her. Okay, so what does this actually formally look like? So we can look, imagine a goal conditioned RL setting, uh, and first we're collecting some data uh, using some policy, uh, as in the kind of standard off policy reinforcement learning setting. Then we, of course, store the data in our replay buffer. 
Uh, and then we perform hindsight relabeling. So what we can do is we can take, uh, we can relabel the experience that we just collected, but take the last state that we actually reached and imagine that that was actually the goal for that task. So we can replace the, um, replace the goal that you were trying to achieve in that task with the goal that you actually achieved and replace the reward function with the distance between the current state and that new hindsight goal. Uh, and then once you have this relabeled experience, you can then store that in your replay buffer as well. Uh, and then, of course, update your policy using your replay buffer uh, and repeat. OK, cool. So um, what about other relabeling strategies? So what this relabeling strategy uses the last goal uh, as, input, as, uh, as the thing that we're, the last state as the thing that we're going to re relabel as the goal. You can also use really any state from the trajectory, uh, and those are also states that were reached. Um, in, in general, you could, you could choose uh, any potential state uh, to relabel with, although in practice, one of the things that's really nice about re, uh, relabeling with a state that you actually reached is that it can alleviate, uh, it can alleviate a, lot of the, um, a lot of the exploration challenges. So uh, if you're exploring for, in the context of one task versus in the context of many tasks, uh, if you accidentally solve one task when trying to perform the other tasks, then you've already, then you've solved the exploration problem for that task. Uh, and this can also kind of bootstrap the kind of, it allows you to kind of bootstrap the learning process. Okay. Any questions on how this works? So we can generalize this also to the multitask RL setting. Um, and this is kind of similar to the setting that we showed uh, in the example. Uh, so the way this looks like is we just, uh, in this case, we just have a, we collect data. In this case, the data core has a, a task identifier rather than a goal state. Um, we store that data. We relabel by, um, for, by selecting some task J, uh, replacing the task identifier with the task identifier for task J, and then replacing the reward function with the rewards, oh, sorry, that should be, the negative shouldn't be there, um, but replacing it with a reward function for task J of the corresponding state. And then storing the relabeled data, updating the policy, and repeating. Um, another question that comes up here, similar to the last slide, is what tasks should we choose to relabel with? Um, you choose randomly, uh, but one good choice in terms of exploration is you could choose tasks in which the trajectory achieves high reward. Uh, and that will help you, uh, those are tasks that, that solve the exploration problem to some degree for um, those tasks. Yeah? So is there a special way to handle hindsight experience replay when the, when the dimensionality of the state space is really high? Yeah, um, we'll talk about that in a few slides. Yeah? So is that kind of thing, our function kind of learn like based on a particular state what reward functions we use? So Um, can you repeat the question? Um, so the R function, like you have RT equals like RJ of the ST, is that gonna like depend on what task you're doing? Like is that trying to like learn, um, okay, so we're doing this task, so the reward function should be this for the state, and then for the different tasks it should be something else, or is it kind of independent of the task? Yeah, so if you initially collected the, the data, um, if you initially collected the data for task I, you would get reward labels for task I. And then if you want to relabel for task J here, then you, uh, you, you want to kind of replace the reward function in that experience with rewards that would correspond to task J. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, now you can't always apply this trick. Uh, so you can apply relabeling when the form of the reward function is known. Uh, this is and evaluatable. If you can't evaluate the reward function in all possible contexts, or it's expensive to evaluate the reward function, like if it, if it requires asking a human, for example, it may be a bit trickier to do this. Uh, it also requires that the dynamics be consistent across goals or tasks that you relabel for. Um, if they're not consistent, then uh, when you have tuples corresponding to state, action, and next state, those tuples will, will no longer be dynamically consistent 
and the resulting policy you get will have data that corresponds to different dynamics that isn't accurate. Um, so this is kind of one example of exploiting the knowledge that we may know that the, the dynamics may be the same across tasks. Um, and you also need to be using an off-policy algorithm um, with an asterisk that I believe that there are some people that have looked at applying this in non-policy settings. Um, but basically, uh, if we're going to be relabeling experience for this task uh, and storing this in a replay buffer, like we don't have the, um, we don't necessarily have the policy that, uh, that collected um, this experience uh, when it was passed in a particular goal state. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, when you have some data K and you come up with, or you choose a task for which that tra those trajectories were sort of good, you think that's gonna work. Is there any reason to come up with multiple tasks? Because on the right here you ask which task to choose. Could you say that let's come up with a few different ones <coughs> and relabel multiply multiple times? Or is it enough to use? Yeah, so I'm maybe I'm not maybe one answer to your question, you can tell me if it answers your question or not, is um, this is I guess in, when I was making this slide, I was assuming that you would have an initial set of tasks that you cared about. There may also be a setting where you just have one task that you care about and you want to leverage other tasks to improve the learning for that task. And in that setting it is important to think about, well, can we construct other like auxiliary tasks yeah, yeah, yeah. for improving? Um, and that will be something that is discussed a bit actually on Wednesday in the paper presentations. Got it. Yeah. Um, I think I had a similar thing I was thinking about. Like, like why not? Um, well, why not like um, like why only pick one task to relay? But why not like duplicate the data for each task, and then each task could make use of that information. Yeah, so you could certainly um, basically choose tasks at, um, at random and, and or just like choose all the tasks essentially. Um, and that, yeah, you can certainly do that. Uh, and then like you could essentially view uh, this version, like task one which the instructor gets for Word as a form of that where you just relabel all of them. And then when you sample data from your replay buffer, you prioritize it to include data that were in which you get high reward, for example. So yeah, you could, you could definitely do that and then think about how you might prioritize later. Um, I guess one downside of doing that is you do have to prioritize potentially, uh, or uh, I guess it kind of depends on the setting. But yeah, typically if you did that, you would probably want to prioritize so that you're not getting a ton of data that you just have zero reward because your policy was attempting completely different things. Okay. Um, so let's just, we can just look at one kind of quick empirical example of what this looks like in practice. So um, the paper from 2017 was looking at this uh, goal conditioned RL in the context of simulated robotic manipulation, where there are tasks such as pushing shown in the top row, sliding shown in the middle row, and pick and place shown in the, um, in the bottom row. I'm, I guess looking at this now, I'm not sure what the difference between pushing and sliding is, uh, but maybe, Maybe that's the kind of details around the paper. Uh, and empirically, if you look at without relabeling versus with relabeling, um, they took a, a, a value-based RL method called DDPG, and the green uh, and dashed red lines show, uh, show DDPG without relabeling, and the red and blue lines show with relabeling with two different relabeling strategies. Uh, and you can see that in, in these settings, relabeling significantly improves performance. Uh, likely mostly because of an exploration challenge. So you see that in the pushing example and in the pick and place example, the original DDPG is basically getting no reward, uh, which means that it's having trouble actually finding any rewards. And so this approach is helping it find rewards for, some, for certain goals um, by essentially amortizing exploration across the different tasks. Okay, cool. Um, and then, since we have a bit more time, uh, we can talk a bit about image observations, which is one of the questions asked uh, before. So one of the things that's, that's important in the goal conditioned RL setting is you need this distance function that tells you how far you are from your state. And this, is, this corresponds to your reward function. But when you have image observations, we don't have good distance functions for images in general. Uh, things like, like L2 distance don't work very well. Uh, and so one thing you could imagine doing is, well, what if you have a binary reward function that basically is just one if the two images are identical and zero otherwise? Um, this will be accurate, uh, but of course it will be very sparse. Um, but there, there are things that, even though it's sparse, there are things that we can do with it. 
uh, and things that we can, ways that we can use this for uh, effective learning. And in particular, one of the things that we can observe is that under the sparse binary reward function, we know that random interaction that's unlabeled uh, is actually optimal if your goal function is to reach the last state at the last time step. So for example, if you have some agent that's randomly kind of uh, exploring in the world, you can say that, okay, this is optimal if all we care about is reaching here at the last time step. And we don't care about any of the other time steps and how we got there. Uh, and so there are things that you can do to actually, uh, you can kind of leverage this insight uh, with a couple different algorithms. So um, the first thing that you can do with this, uh, well, first it means it's easier to deal with image observations because we can use the zero one reward function. Um, the first thing you can do is you can use it for better learning. So if you know the data is optimal with respect to that reward function, what if we just use supervised imitation learning on that data? Um, so in imitation learning, we typically assume that we have optimal demonstrations. Uh, here, if that's our reward function, this, these random interactions for goal condition to RL correspond to optimal behavior. And so what we could do is we could collect data from, from some policy, perform hindsight relabeling where we use the last state as the goal in hindsight, store the relabeled data in some replay buffer, and then update your policy just using supervised imitation learning conditioned on the relabeled goal on your replay buffer. Um, so it turns out you can, you can do this and it actually does decently well in a number of domains. Um, one uh, paper that did this, uh, the way that they collected data was actually uh, by using data from a human that was kind of interacting in uh, not completely random ways, but in more directed ways, but still in, uh, less optimal ways as you might think. So they collected data from human play uh, and performed goal condition imitation learning on this data. Uh, so here is uh, an example of the, the play data. So this is just a human doing a bunch of random stuff in this ex environment in virtual reality. Uh, and this data, there's no reward functions in this data or anything. Uh, but what you can do is you can take some, uh, one of the kind of states in this thing uh, you can train a, a goal conditioned function, basically a policy that takes as input a goal image and the current image and regresses to the actions that the human took for different windows of this data. Uh, and as a result, you get a policy that looks like the bottom right um, that is able to reach uh, goals, including pressing buttons. Uh, for example, it's trying to press the green button, it's trying to press the blue button. Now it's trying to slide the door over to the left. Um, it's able to do kind of all of these different goals just by using that, that data. Okay, um, are there any other ways to use this insight? So another thing that we could do uh, with this insight is we could try to use it to learn a better goal representation. Uh, so if we have this zero one goal representation, this isn't very good for reinforcement learning, but we can use it to uh, learn a better goal representation. And in particular, we can imagine the question, which representation when uses a reward function will cause a planner to choose the observed actions? Uh, and so we could, First, collect random unlabeled interaction data. In this case, we'll collect data of just a robot, like t sampling from a random Gaussian distribution, as shown here. Uh, we'll then train a latent state representation and a latent space model such that if we plan a sequence of actions with respect to the last state, we re recover the observed action sequence. Um, so essentially, this corresponds to uh, embedding a, uh, a planner in latent space into a goal condition policy and train that goal condition policy with supervised learning to match the observed actions. Uh, so we could use this policy directly as in the previous paper, um, but we can also throw away the latent space model and return the goal representation that the planner was using, the planner was using inside that policy uh, and combine that, that goal representation with reinforcement learning. Um, so this is referred to as distributional planning networks in the sense that it's uh, performing this planning procedure inside the neural network and outputting a distribution over action sequences. Uh, and what you can do with this metric uh, is this metric is the metric that it gives you is much more shaped because the, the planner has to be able to use that shaped reward function. Uh, if you only gave it the sparse reward function, it wouldn't be able to succeed. Um, you can do this, uh, you can take out this, this metric, uh, run reinforcement learning with respect to this metric on a variety of vision-based robotic learning tasks. Uh, and then compare to a variety of other metrics, such as pixel distance and distance in a VAE latent space. And you can see that the metric that comes from this procedure, shown in green, 
leads to uh, much more successful reinforcement learning because it's able to recover both an accurate and a shaped reward function. And so you can get behavior that looks like this, where it can figure out how to reach an image of a goal uh, or figure out how to, to push an object uh, to reach an image of a goal. Uh, and it can also be used in the real world uh, for like reaching a certain goal image or for uh, pushing an object, for example. Okay, um, so to summarize, uh, what we talked about today is uh, what is the multitask RL problem, how we can we apply policy gradients to this problem, and how we can think about doing uh, weight sharing as well as data sharing in both uh, policy gradient settings and in Q-learning settings. Um, so there's a number of remaining questions, some of which you brought up today that we'll cover in the next two weeks. Uh, so for example, uh, can we use auxiliary tasks to accelerate the learning process? Uh, and this will be the, uh, the focus of, uh, of Wednesday. Uh, what about hierarchies of tasks where we have subtasks and then we want to learn higher level policies that operate um, on those subtasks? Uh, can we learn exploration strategies across tasks rather than um, kind of using a single, kind of just using vanilla, um, vanilla approaches? And also, uh, what do meta RL algorithms actually learn uh, when applied to various settings. Um, so we'll be covering each of these. The first will be covered on Wednesday in the paper presentations. Uh, the second one will be covered on Monday next week in paper presentations. Um, next Wednesday, we'll have a guest lecture by Kate Rickelli, uh, who is the first author on a recent off-policy meta-RL paper that is, uh, I think, currently the state-of-the-art method in, in meta-reinforcement learning. Uh, and then on Monday, we'll, um, we'll have paper presentations that study emergent phenomenon in meta reinforcement learning. Um, for those of you that don't have quite as much experience in reinforcement learning, there are additional reinforcement learning resources such as the Stanford course, uh, the UCL course from David Silver, and the Berkeley course. And I believe that all of these courses have lecture videos online. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, those could be helpful. Uh, and it could also be useful for the homework. Um, and then a couple of reminders, homework two is due on Wednesday. Homework three covers hindsight experience replay and goal conditioned RL. And that will be out this Wednesday and due in a couple weeks after that. Uh, and then the project proposal is due next Wednesday. Okay, see you on Wednesday.